Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Warren Fong. I'm a consultant rheumatologist in the Department of Rheumatology and Immunology, Singapore General Hospital. Today, I'll be giving you a short talk on ankylosing spondylitis and spondyloarthritis. The learning objectives of today are to describe the concept of spondyloarthritis, be aware of the epidemiology of ankylosing spondylitis and relationship with HLA B27 gene, to understand the pathophysiology of ankylosing spondylitis and be aware of the clinical features of spondyloarthritis and the classification criteria of spondyloarthritis, as well as be aware of the treatment modalities for ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis belongs to the family of spondyloarthritis, which includes other diseases such as psoriatic arthritis, acute anterior uveitis, reactive arthritis, arthritis related to inflammatory bowel disease, as well as juvenile spondyloarthritis. They all share a common genetic predisposition with the HLA B27 gene. Each disease has a predominant clinical phenotype, but they can have overlapping features such as spinal and pelvic joint dysfunction, psoriasis, gut inflammation, and uveitis. Patients with spondyloarthritis can be divided into two broad categories, patients with predominant axial symptoms or patients with predominant peripheral symptoms. For patients with axial spondyloarthritis, the typical diagnosis is that of ankylosing spondylitis. Under the group of patients with predominant peripheral joint arthritis, this would include diseases such as reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, arthritis associated with inflammatory bowel diseases, as well as undifferentiated spondyloarthritis. In the past, ankylosing spondylitis referred to a group of patients who had radiographic disease, and this was defined by the presence of sacral elitis present on the pelvic x-ray. With modern technology, patients can have absence of sacral elitis present on the pelvic x-ray, but positive sacral elitis present on MRI. These group of patients are now classified as having axial spondyloarthritis. As such, Patients can be defined as having axial spondyloarthritis earlier on in the clinical course of the disease. The prevalence of ankylosing spondylitis in Singapore is estimated to be about 0.5%, and it is three times more common in males. Age of onset of ankylosing spondylitis is seldom beyond the age of 45 years. 90% of individuals with ankylosing spondylitis will be HLA B27 positive. However, this gene only contributes 20% of the hereditability of the disease. Only 5% of individuals with HLA B27 positivity will go on to develop ankylosing spondylitis. And ankylosing spondylitis rarely develops in families in the absence of HLA B27. The risk of developing ankylosing spondylitis in a first-degree relative is about 8%. The pathogenesis of ankylosing spondylitis is likely multifactorial. It is postulated genetic susceptibility coupled with altered gut microbiome and defective gut mucosal immunity leads to the activation of inflammatory pathways that are mediated by interleukin-23 and interleukin-27, and hence inflammation in the entheses and abnormal osteoproliferation then occurs at involved sites. Signs of spondyloarthritis includes that of peripheral arthritis, Achilles tendonitis or enthesitis, as well as uveitis. Uveitis can be present in about a third of patients, with anterior uveitis being the most common. There is no clear relationship between articular disease and uveitis. 
Uveitis is typically unilateral. Patients can have red and painful eyes and experience visual disturbance. Patients can have spontaneous resolution of the uveitis and in cases which are refractory, treatment often results in resolution of symptoms in about 4 weeks. Uveitis is more common in individuals who are HLA B27 positive. Patients with spondyloarthritis can also have psoriasis, dactylitis, erythema nodosum, as well as inflammatory bowel disease. This is the ASAS classification criteria for spondyloarthritis in 2009. Patients can be classified as having spondyloarthritis based on two broad categories. In patients with predominant back pain of more than 3 months and age of onset of less than 45 years, they will be classified as having spondyloarthritis if they have sacral elitis on imaging and one other spondyloarthritis feature, or if they are HLA B27 positive with two or more spondyloarthritis features. Features of spondyloarthritis would include inflammatory back pain, presence of peripheral arthritis, heel enthesitis, uveitis, dactylitis, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, patients having good response of their arthritis, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, a family history of spondyloarthritis, HLA B27 positivity, or elevated C-reactive protein levels. Patients can also be classified as having spondyloarthritis if they have peripheral symptoms only. And these patients would then have to have arthritis or enthesitis or dactylitis and either one or two spondyloarthritis features depending on what they are. Inflammatory back pain is classified as patients with four out of the five of the following symptoms. Age of onset less than 40 years old, insidious onset of back pain, back pain with improvement with exercise, back pain that does not improve with rest, and back pain that is worse at night and improves on getting up. Sacral ileitis can be detected on the X-ray as well as the MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. On your left, the patient has at least grade 3 bilateral sacral elitis present on the pelvic x-ray. On your right, the MRI shows the presence of periarticular bone marrow edema and active sacral elitis on fat-saturated T2-weighted sequence of the MRI. Sacral elitis can also be present on stir sequences and there should be two or more lesions in one slice of the MRI image or a single lesion in two or more consecutive slices before this can be considered a positive MRI finding of sacral elitis. Patients with ankylosing spondylitis can have presence of syndesmophytes or a bamboo spine and this is illustrated by the lumbar x-ray on the left as well as the chest x-ray present on the right. In activated inflammatory cells, for example the macrophage, soluble tumor necrosis factors are released and these bind to membrane-bound tumor necrosis factor receptors on target cells and these then result in inflammation. With the invention of tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, soluble as well as membrane-bound tumor necrosis factors are inhibited and this reduces inflammation dramatically. This new drug has changed the way that we are able to treat refractory ankylosing spondylitis. This is the 2015 American College of Rheumatology treatment recommendations for ankylosing spondylitis. In patients with active ankylosing spondylitis, it is strongly recommended to use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents and it is recommended that patients use these medications 
continuously when they have active disease. If their disease remains active, it is then recommended that patients then go on to tumor necrosis factor inhibitors or TNF inhibitors for short. And if their disease remains active to one TNF inhibitor, it is suggested that they switch to an alternative TNF inhibitor. For patients with peripheral arthritis or enthesitis, for example, doctors can inject local glucocorticoids. However, do avoid injecting local steroids to the Achilles, patella, or quadriceps tendons. Physical therapy is very important, and this is strongly recommended in all patients. Active physical activity, as well as land-based physical activity, is preferred over passive physical activity or aquatic-based physical activities. Physicians should use validated disease activity measures to monitor their patients and use the presence of C-reactive protein or erythrocyte sedimentation rate to guide their therapy. In patients with stable ankylosing spondylitis, it is recommended that patients can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents on demand when they have pain, and if they were previously on NSAIDs and TNF inhibitors, they can actually reduce their medications to only TNF inhibitors alone. Physical therapy is still strongly recommended and patients should continue this throughout their lives. Again, patients should be monitored using validated disease activity measures, which includes the presence of C-reactive protein or erythrocyte sedimentation rate monitoring. In summary, Ankylosing spondylitis is part of the family of spondyloarthropathies. Early referral to a rheumatologist is useful if the patient is aged less than 45, has chronic lower back pain for more than 3 months, with either the presence of sacroiliitis either detected on x-ray or MRI, or positive HLA-B27. Extra-articular manifestations include that of uveitis, or gut inflammation, for example. First-line treatment of ankylosing spondylitis is often with NSAIDs or COX-2 inhibitors.